Just want to mention to you, as far as announcements, before we get on with the uh, message, at 6 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, we'll be meeting at the elementary school for a prayer walk at the elementary school. We did that at the high school and middle school this past Monday. I appreciate each and every one of you that participated. There were several churches represented. I believe at least five pastors were there and then uh, members, different members from their church also. And so it was a good, you know, good showing for that. But uh, if you can be a part of that, we'll be at the elementary school at six o'clock, about an hour. We'll pray about an hour. So if you, in case you wonder. And so um, again, uh, you know, our, our young people are worth it, amen, that we take time and just get on the campus and, and pray for them. Uh, we've been talking about prayer, but our message has been prayer the last few weeks, and of course we'll continue with that. But we know prayer makes a difference, amen? We read some uh, testimonies just this week of uh, people that were in very difficult situations. Uh, some, um, you know, even through those circumstances, they experienced loss, but you know what? God still, he's still on the throne. Yes. He hears our prayer. Even in loss, you know, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He, his hand is with us. He'll guide, his presence is with us. And so prayer makes a difference. You know, um, the Satan is not scared of programs. He's not scared of outreach. Uh, he's not scared of worship service as long as it's without prayer. But let me tell you something. When we pray, when we approach the throne of God and we pray, we recognize that we need God's hand in our life. When we recognize we need His power and His guidance, that makes a difference. That makes Satan nervous whenever we take time and we humble ourselves and we pray. We call on the name of the Lord for, for, for every need in every circumstance. The Bible says pray without ceasing. What does it mean? Just never stop praying. Nothing is too small. Nothing is too great to approach God in prayer. Amen? So we want to continue on prayer. Uh, this morning, our title is Deliver Us From Evil. And so if you would, please stand with us. We, we've been, um, um, we've been a portion of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to just, we're going to pray the Lord. We're going to read the Lord's Prayer. And if you would, if you would, just please um, say it. Let's say it together. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Let's say it together if you would. In this manner, therefore, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing for God's word. Thank you for helping us out. And so we talked about the first week, we talked about our Father in heaven, holy or hallowed be your name. And I'm thankful that Jesus Christ, he, should, he gave us the pattern of prayer to approach the God of heaven as our Father. We have that relationship. He desires that same relationship as a Father and a Son. And so, and then hallowed or holy is your name. We serve a holy God. We serve a just God. Uh, he cannot be tempted with evil, nor can he tempt with evil. We're going to have that verse. We're going to read that verse a little later on, but we serve a holy God. The angels in heaven this morning are singing, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. There are created beings that are crying, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. We serve a holy God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know, uh, we mentioned this last week. There's a, whatever, if we're not careful, our prayers can be self-centered. They can get small. But he prayed that uh, your kingdom come. In other words, remind us that Jesus indeed is coming. You know what? They, uh, they were not, they, he did not come as they expected him the first time. The religious people missed Jesus Christ. Even though he was born in Bethlehem as he was prophesied. Even though he was from the lineage of the house of David. He come as a carpenter's son. They expected him to come in on a shining white horse uh, with, uh, with military power and run Rome out of town. But that's not the way he came. And so they missed him because he didn't come as they expected him. And I'm afraid that we live in a world that is so busy, this 24-7, this nonstop, that we're going to be so busy that we're not looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. We're not attentive. It's not on our mind. But uh, the, the Lord's Prayer reminds us, your kingdom come. He is coming. And we need to be ready. Our loved ones need to be ready. We need to be kingdom-minded. And then it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, we know that, again, 
Um, it's God's what, what uh, we want to we want to go through according to God's will. It's God's will for that we come to salvation. It's God's will that we obey Him, and we know not everyone is obeying Him on this earth. We know the day will come when both heaven and earth will line up. The will, uh, everything will be done according to His will on earth and as it is in heaven. That's not happened yet, but we know that day is coming. His kingdom is coming where His will is will be done on both earth and heaven. But you know what? We want to do We want to do God's will. Amen. There are people, obviously, in this world who are not. They're not concerned about God's will. But we want to... God, we want God's will to be accomplished in our life because that is where satisfaction comes. That's where joy comes. That's where fulfillment comes when we uh, fulfill God's plan. Give us this day our daily bread. Yesterday's bread is gone. We're not sure how tomorrow's bread may come, but give us today our daily bread. He is our provider. If God already knows our need, why does he ask us to pray for our daily bread? Because we acknowledge by whose hand we're, friend, we're fed. Amen. We recognize that everything comes from God. Our abilities, our strength. That song uh, we sang, uh, uh, to, to use our bread, to, to cry out, to worship him. He gives us our very bread. He gives us the strength that we have. He is our provider. Yeah. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And if you're free of debt, that's a great way to live. Amen. That's the way the Bible tells us to live. But if you're indebted, you know how, if you owe somebody, you know how, how freeing it is when we finally pay that off. But we have the opportunity to, to, to release someone else of their debts. Whenever people sin against us, it's counted as a debt. And that's how Jesus, everybody uh, understands money from the oldest in the room to the children in the next room. They understand money. They have a concept of money. And so Jesus likened our trespasses as a debt. And you know what? There are those who have done against us. They, uh, uh, there's a debt there. But you know what? We want to be forgiven of God. And God, we want to be uh, those that forgive those who have done uh, wrong against us because we've been forgiven. Amen. We have been forgiven and we can offer that forgiveness. And then today, in verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. We have, we have needs as people. We have the need of, of, um, of food. We have need of a house, a place to stay. Uh, we have a need to be forgiven. We were not created to carry the weight of unforgiveness. We know that that creates, we talked about last week, the different um, in the impact it has on our body it has a negative impact on our body when we carry unforgiveness. We were not intended to carry that weight. And when we do, our body shows signs of it. Our spirit shows signs of it. Our disposition shows signs of it. But whenever we're free from that debt, whenever we've been forgiven and we're willing to forgive, that frees our spirit. That, um, that, that, does, that root of bitterness that wants to take root is cast out. Um, then we're, we're, and we're, we are in relationship with God Almighty as it was intended. But we have other needs. We know that we live in a world of evil. We live in a world where evil is present. And you know what? Not everyone wants to recognize that there is a devil. But there is a devil. The devil is what is, is uses this evil to, to carry out his will and his plan. And so Jesus prayed do, to lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And you know, it's in order for us to pray for integrity. That's a great need in this world. Amen. We can point our finger and say, well, you know, we're seeing corruption in the government. Or we're seeing corruption here. We're seeing corruption in seemingly everywhere we go. And there's a lot, there's much we cannot do that. We can't do much about that. But this one here in the mirror, the one that we look in the mirror, we can do something about that. And God desires us to be people of integrity. In other words, let our yes be yes and let our no be no. Let's, let's serve one another. Let's do our work without partiality. Just as God does, he is impartial. In other words, us to be people of integrity. If we say it, we shake our hand on it, we agree to it, then that's the way it's going to be with everything within us. We understand things happen where we cannot carry out a vow, so to speak, or a promise, but we let that person know or what that party, whatever it may be, this is where I'm at. And uh, this is uh, this was the plan, but this is where I'm at. Let's be people of integrity. Lead us not into temptation. So what is temptation? It is any draw or desire or enticement towards sin, which is a problem since sin is our great problem. Amen? Sin is our problem. We live in a fallen world. We live uh, in this flesh. We're bound by this flesh. 
And so temptation is that draw towards sin. Sin is the ultimate enemy of humanity because that's what makes evil evil and the devil the devil. Remember, Satan was a created being. He was uh, beautiful. He was full of abilities and he led worship in heaven. But the day came where he said, you know what? I'm tired of worshiping God. I'm ready for them to worship me. And pride, he allowed pride to grow in his heart. And, and through pride, he said, you know what? I want to be worshiped. I'm going to take down the most high. I want to be in his position. And he was cast out of heaven. That was the original sin was pride, thinking that he could take the place of God. He was a create. He still is a created being. God, there is no comparison to God. There's nothing to compare him with. Amen. He is. He know, he's all knowing. He's all present. He's all powerful. Satan has no claim on that. He is in one place. He is not all knowing. He does, he's he's limited in his power. He wants to make you think he's the biggest deal on the, the biggest deal. He's not. He's limited. And so we understand that sin is what made the devil the devil. Again, the danger of temptation is sin. Being tempted is not evil. We're all tempted. We all have to resist that temptation. We're all tempted. It's what we do with that uh, temptation. The main sources of temptation is the world, the flesh, and the devil. How hard is the devil's work? We are living in flesh. We are prone to go away, do our own thing rather than uh, things of God. We see that in the in the valley, uh, in the the Garden of Eden. Um, Adam and Eve, there's only one thing to abstain from, that tree, that one tree. And yet in time, they were tempted and they gave into it. In this world that we live in, temptation is on what? Every side. Every side. Can't even watch commercials. There, It's on every side. All right. So when Jesus prayed, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Is, was Jesus saying that God tempts us to sin? The Bible tells us in James chapter 1 and verses 12 through 14. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And so the question was prompted me the other day about Abraham. Uh, was he tempted? And so uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, what was the difference? We know that God tempts no one to sin. Temptation comes from our own desires. Now King David was tempted when he was at his palace. And instead of being out there on the field with the soldiers, there was a battle going on. Instead of being out there in the field with the soldiers, he's laying up in a palace. So he gets up from his afternoon nap and he walks to the window to feel that cool, cool breeze blow in. And lo and behold, Bathsheba's out there on the top of her house taking a bath. And, and uh, David is tempted. In other words, he sees that. And instead of fleeing from that, instead of that, he, was, he wasn't living in a one-room house. There was plenty of other places he could have went. Instead of, of fleeing from that, instead of turning, turning away from it, going back where he come from, he continues to look and he continues to lust and he's facing temptation. Instead of resisting that temptation, he's given in to temptation. And now uh, he has the power and he has the authority. He can bring her to his own household. And so he does. He's already married. He's got wives. He does not need... Bathsheba, she belongs to a, a captain of his, uh, of his guard, of his, of his army, a good man. But uh, David yields to that temptation and he brings her to himself and gets her pregnant. Well, now he's in a, in a mess. What he's going to do? And so as a result, Uriah, a good man, is killed. In other words, David did not resist it. God did not create that temptation. That temptation came outside his window. God didn't tell David to go look at Bathsheba. God didn't tell him to take him, take her as his wife. He resisted him that, but he didn't. He he he. In other words, God uh, his conscience worked against that, but he overread that and he followed that temptation. And so we know that it paid a heavy price for that. As a result of that, violence was in David's house from then on. Before then, the battle was outside. The battle was outside the walls of the city, so to speak. But after that, because of his sin, the battle came into his house. And he had to deal with that the rest of his days. God did not create that. Think about whenever uh, Abraham, uh, God told Abraham to go tempt his son. 
I'm not tempted to sell to take his son. So Abraham, he's sitting in his house, in his tent, and he's got the t-shirt, God is good, amen? God has been good to him. And, and God said, hey, take your son, your only son. That was not Abraham's desire. In other words, it was David's desire to be with Bathsheba, and he followed that. It was not Abraham's desire to sacrifice his own son. This was a, this was a test. This was something to test <laughs> Abraham's obedience. And God said, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him to him. Now, Abraham knew this is not the way things normally go. But he believed that no matter what, that God was in it. So he took up, the Bible says, early the next morning. He saddled up the donkeys and head out. That would have been a good time to lay up in bed for a while. Amen. You're taking your own son to you. No hurry to be going to the mountain, so to speak. But Abraham immediately obeyed and he took uh, uh, Isaac to the mountain. But God knew how it was going to end. Yeah. And it was a test of his obedience. It was a test of, of would he obey me if I spoke to him. And of course, um, Abraham followed through. And God knew along all the way he was going to provide a lamb. He was going to just test Abraham, and he provided a lamb. When that arm went up, he cried out to Abraham and said, Do your son no harm, for I have provided a lamb. And you know what? God himself did that very thing a little later on. When Jesus Christ that lived that perfect life, he was led up to a hill, and his blood was shed for our forgiveness. In other words, this was an object lesson of things yet to come. God gave his only son, much different than the circumstance that uh, David found in himself. Yeah. David was carried away by his own desires. Abraham was led of God to do what he did. There was a difference there. He was tested by God to offer up this uh, son as an as a offering to see what he would do, to see where his, uh, if he would obey the God of heaven, if he would listen to the God of heaven. Again, Ab God knew how it was going to end. He would provide that um, circumstance. So why would God allow such things to happen? Why would God allow us to be in a time of, of, of testing? If, it is, if it's his will to abstain from sin, then why does he permit us to be tempted by our own desires or even de demonic influence? Why does he desire that if he wants us to be people of integrity? We see in the book of James that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. The one who endures to the end will receive a crown of life. And so we know that God wants to produce in us, as we mentioned earlier, He wants us to be people of integrity. Yeah. God wants us to be people of depth. He wants us not to be superficial. He doesn't want us to be just a facade. And whenever we go through these trials and these temptations, whenever Abraham, he packed up that, those, uh, those donkeys or whatever it might be, and, and him and Isaac and the servants went up that mountain, that, that took quite a bit of grit. And then he gets up there and he goes up a little farther up the, hill, up the mountain and uh, he tells the servants to leave behind. And, uh, and, he's, and Isaac's looking at him and said, hey, we got the wood, we got the fire. Well, where's the sacrifice? It had been difficult to keep on marching up that hill, right? And then he bound him up. Isaac submitted himself. He was 14, 15, 16 years old. He could have got away from Abraham. But he submitted himself to uh, Abraham's will. He, he submitted to being bound up, to being put on that. That took some, that took some depth of soul, wouldn't you say? Yeah. To give your son like that. To see if you would obey him. You know what? God wants us to be people of death. He wants us to be not to be superficial. And that's one thing that has plagued uh, Christianity in America is superficial, being superficial and, ch and, and shallow. He wants us to be people of death. death. And you know what? Uh, the, um, going through trials creates that death. Just as those of you that have been in the military, in order for you to be a part of that army or that navy or that, uh, that military branch, you had to go through basic training. You had to find out and separate the boys from the from the guy, the boys from the men, men from the boy. Here we go, the men. I was going to say the guys from the gals. They like, should have already known that ahead of time, right? <laughs> Separate the boys, men from the boys. And of course, I know our ladies go through it too. But in other words, you have to go through their uh, basic uh, training to make sure that you're able to, to do what you're able to do, to do what you need to do, that you're able to take orders, that you're able to uh, go through the physical uh, activity that's required to be a soldier. And the same way, these trials is to bring death to us. Amen? He wants us to be someone who's experienced the deliverance of God. How many can testify that I've seen God move on my behalf? Amen? Amen. And you know what? That's what he wants. He wants us to be people that have a testimony. He doesn't want us to be shallow or superficial. 
So if God goes through trials, God brings us through trials for our ultimate good. Why does Jesus ask us to pray that he would lead us not into temptation? We will certainly go through trials as God's design. We pray that we don't give in to sin as we pass through them. In other words, the are, these are times when it tries our soul. These are times whenever, uh, these are difficult times. But you want that we pray that we do not give in to temptation. At Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray that they enter not into temptation. Jesus' greatest trial was the crucifixion. And in great distress, he prayed to be spared from the suffering. But yet more important, he prayed that the, the Father's will be done. And that gives us an example of how to pray. There are times when we say, Lord, spare me from this difficulty. There are times when we pray, Lord, spare me from this suffering. But ultimately, God, your will be done. There must be a lesson that I need to learn. There must be something that you need to work in me. There must be something that I've yet to see that, it, that will be revealed during this difficult time. So we pray, God, thy will be done. Lord, even in our hour of temptation, thy will be done. That's what Jesus prayed. Had it not been, uh, his whole mission was to go to that cross. He knew that. And so we know that we, uh, as him, we should, when we're in a difficult time, we pray, Lord, your will be done. But Lord, keep me from, I do not want to sin during this time. Keep, help me in this uh, temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, this is what it says. No temptation has overtaken you, such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. Again, David had a, a, a door of escape. He could have just turned around and went back where he came from, but he did not. Uh, he cultivated that, that lust and he cultivated that temptation and it led to sin. It's the same way with us. When we're faced with that temptation, when you're battling temptation this morning, I want to remind us this morning that when there is a door of escape. There is strength to stand. We have to depend on Him. Amen. If we depend on our own ability, as we mentioned, a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. If we try to walk in our own strength, if we try to live in our own strength, we're not going to be that person of integrity that God desires. But when we put our dependence on Him, Lord, I need you to help me. I know that my strength comes from you. I know my help comes from you. He will help us. He will show us how that door of escape during a time of temptation. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, for, he, for in that he himself has suffered, talking about Jesus being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He was, he was tempted in all ways. Yeah. And so he can give us the strength. Amen? Yeah. Anybody face temptation this past week? Yes. Amen. The second part. It's just as important as the first part. Delivers from evil. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That describes the devil. And we know that, there again, there are those that uh, do not acknowledge that there is a devil. I assure you, there is a devil. Even though sin is our great en enemy, we should not underestimate the danger of Satan. Peter described him as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I'm glad this, the key word here, the key phrase is may devour. With God's help, we are not without defense. Amen. We have defense. We have God's word. We have God's word to guide us and to give us strength. Um, uh, G, um, Abraham stood on God's word. God spoke to him. He stood on that. Had David stood on God's word, he would have not yielded to that temptation with Bathsheba. He did not acknowledge God's word during that time. And you know what? He failed the temptation. We have the work of Christ. Uh, he overcome death, hell, and the grave. Amen. He gives us the victory. He rebukes Satan himself. Give us a pattern. He gives us a pattern on how to pray. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to stand against the temptation of sin. Amen? Amen. How many knows the Holy Ghost gives us power? The Holy Spirit Amen. gives us power over Amen. sin. Amen? Amen? Yes, He does. Satan is powerful, but he is also limited. Just as we should pray for grace to stand in the hour of temptation, we should pray to be protected from the wiles of Satan. He is a deceiver. He would love to, he to see. He's at work deceiving our children even now. He's at work to deceive us, to get us off track. He's at work at, uh, deceiving us about the goodness of God and what God wants to accomplish in our lives. 
You know, we might be uh, tempted by lust or drunkenness, but you know what? He will also tempt us to doubt our forgiveness in Jesus Christ. How many has ever been tempted by doubts before? Amen. D uh, doubt that God is going to come through. Doubt that God is that God is good. Doubt that God hears our prayers and a thousand other doubts. We are tempted that. We may not be tempted to, to be drunken or we may not be tempted to steal, but we have other temptations that we have to deal with. That Again, that doubt of who God is and what he's capable of doing. Isn't that how Satan attacked Eve? He made her doubt the goodness of God. Hey, didn't, what's wrong with this deal? God, surely God didn't mean what he said. And you know what? He'll hit us the same way. Sure, he didn't mean what and what he said about uh, not being envious or not stealing or not lying. Surely, it'll be okay for this one time, right? By the way, it's just me, right? You've got to be careful. Satan's a deceiver. And he'll, he's patient. He's had a lot of practice time we come along, amen? And so we need to be, uh, we, as Jesus, we need to pray that um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All sin is, to, is disobedience. All sin is disobedience. But it comes either in our actions or our inactions. In other words, when God moves upon us to do something, God inspires us to go to that person and forgive them. When we do not, that is sin because we've not obeyed what God has told us to do. It's along with our action. If we sin or we lie or we cheat or we're envious, that's an action. But our inaction is just as dangerous whenever we do not do the things that God has put on our heart to do or what God's word commands us to do. Distraction is a great tool in Satan's hand. As great of a tool, distraction is as great of a tool in Satan's hand as persecution. And again, in this world that we live in, this fast-paced world that we live in, it's easy to get distracted off of God's will. Amen? It's easy to get on that uh, sometimes that worry wheel or just to, to keep up, try to keep up with what this world, what's going on in this world, that can become a great distraction. You know, there are people we uh, talked about a few weeks ago, uh, especially on Wednesday night, of, of the different countries that are facing very intense persecution, Nigeria, and North Korea, and China, and a few other countries. And those Christians are dealing with, do I, if, what happened with life and death? In other words, if they acknowledge that Jesus Christ is life, they run the risk of losing their life. That's a real temptation. They have to study. They have to think about that. The welfare of their kids and their children. But you know what? Many of them stand. They say, you know what? Come what may. I'm not going to reject my Christ. And you know what? They pay a heavy price. But in the United States, we're not our, right now. Our life is not on a hand on the land. On our our life is not. Um, it's not life or death. But you know what? We can be tempted to be indifferent. We can be uh, tempted to uh, not care about the lost and love the lost in this world, the lost in our neighborhood that are not ready to meet Him. And in other words, we're uh, tempted by inaction. Amen. We're tempted to, to uh, not be concerned about our brothers and sisters. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Our temptation is to fall asleep like the disciples at Gethsemane, indifferent to what's going on, complacent, apathetic. That's a temptation also to not care. Because you know what? Jesus Christ cares, right? Yeah. He cares for us. Yeah. He cares for our neighbors. He cares for those that are not ready. It's not God's will that any should perish. He is right. concerned Hallelujah. about those that we come in contact with that are not ready to meet Jesus Christ. He's concerned about those in other countries that have never heard the gospel, not even the first time. He's concerned, and we have a responsibility that we do our part. We can't save the world, so to speak, but we can do our part. Amen. We can do what we can do. And so we are tempted to fall asleep. We're tempted to be, um, again, apathetic to the circumstance. It's easy for us to do because nobody's knocking on our door asking, well, I'll tell you what, uh, if you're a Christian, you're going to live. If you're not, uh, this is your last day. We're not faced with that, but we're faced with being apathetic to God's uh, command to go out to the world and be a witness. Amen? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, you there, Paul speaking to Timothy says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard from, among, from me among my witnesses, commit these to faithful men who, is, who will be able to teach others. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one 
engaged in warfare, entangles, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And so we have to be careful that we don't busy our life to the point we do not obey God and what he wants us to do. Yeah. Amen? There's good things, and then there's what God desires us to do. We get, and good things can crowd out what God wants to do in our life. Amen? It may be a good thing, but is it God's will for you to be involved in it? That's the question. So we're talking about the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not in temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Is not the very purpose of prayer to mold us to God's will and vision. Is that not the very purpose that we pray, that we mold into God's plan? Too many times we make prayer for God to mold into our plans, but it's for us to mold into His plan, His vision. May the Father awaken us of the evil of sin, the goodness of Jesus and the greatness of God's glory. Help us to see the evil of sin. Help us not to play with it like David. David engaged in it and, it and it paid a great price. Whereas when Abraham, when God spoke to Abraham, he obeyed, he carried out the plan that God had for him. And then the last phrase, for thine is the kingdom, the power and glory. We were, are reminded of the wonder of God. And you know what? I'm so thankful that we have every age, every generation here in this church. We have, the, we have older people that have been, have been there, done that, have experience that we can learn from. And we have our young people. And the one thing I love about our young people is they live in a, in a life of wonder. In other words, the, uh, they are still impressed by things. They're still at wonder of the things that go along in this world. And too many times we lose that wonder when we get a little older. But we have to remember, remember that God is a God of wonder. He is a God of, of uh, 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 indescribable in so many ways. And the longer we seek Him, the more we'll see of Him. We will not be bored with our relationship with God. Uh, the, you can get bored in the things of this world. But let me tell you something. When we seek God with a whole heart, whenever we pray a kingdom prayer, whenever we pray a prayer that's God-centered and is concerned about this world that we live in, not just our own uh, interests, we can see some of that wonder. Whenever we realize, whenever we awaken the day and we begin our day, that this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We begin to see the wonder of God. Rather than thinking of our tasks, the mundane task, it'll have to be accomplished before sundown. But whenever we realize this is, this is God's gift to us and help us to make the most of it, help us to see God's wonder. Amen. If we look for God's wonder, we'll see it. Amen. Sister Tammy and I were able to see the sun just up over the horizon this morning. It was beautiful. It was the handiwork of God, a beautiful picture, uh, the handiwork of God, part of his wonder. That's just a small thing compared to uh, the things that he has in store if we just look for it. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power and the glory. For the kingdom does belong to God. God is supreme and sovereign all things.
attempt is to take the shortcut. Satan attempts us to take, um, to do something stupid. Well, God is with me. God is with me. He is with us, but he gives us a mind to think. Amen. We're tempted to take and, and um, get off track of what God has said. You can turn them rocks into stone. He had that power. If you can walk on water, you can turn rocks to bread. But God didn't, Jesus didn't use his power um, for, for that. He used it to, for the other. He said, in other words, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. I came to serve rather than to be served. He didn't use his power to serve himself. He used his power to serve others. Amen. Amen. And you know what? That's some of the ways that we're tempted along with with the, the, um, the images that we are bombarded with to create lust in our, in our, in our hearts and minds. We're tempted with that. Uh, to tempted to, well, to be envious of other people. Again, this world that we live in, I'm thankful that we live in the U.S. of A, but you know what? We see temptation on every side, and we have to resist it. And you know what? God will give us the strength to do that. We have to set limitations. There are times when we have to distance ourselves from that source of temptation. That's what Jesus is saying. Lead us not into, into temptation. In other words, when we go through the valley, when we go through a difficult time, Lord, keep us from that temptation and deliver us from the evil one. We live in a world where people here make a choice. You know what? When somebody makes a good choice to bless, those that come to that food bank, someone has made a choice to bless, and they experience that blessing. And before the week is out, we'll see somebody has made a choice to bring destruction to this world, and we'll see the fallout of it. God has given us a choice, and that's a hard one to reconcile. Why is there evil in this world? Why is there good in this world? Why is there good in this world? God gives us a choice. God gives mankind a choice. He gave Adam and Eve a choice in that, in that garden. He gives us a choice. We can do good or we can do evil. But I'm telling you for sure that everyone will stand before God and give an account for those choices that made. This is that this we're sure of. Amen. And even though we live in an evil world where it seems evil is on the rise, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace does much more. So I know this for sure. We may we may suffer from the evil of this world, but we know that his grace is sufficient. He will keep us. I'm sure of that. He will keep us. Amen. He's got a plan. It's not random. It may seem random to me. It, it, it may seem unfair to me, but I know that God is just and I know His grace is sufficient to keep us in this hour that we live in. Come what may. Come what may. Because we have a choice. Mankind has a choice. There's not a soul in heaven. There's not a soul in heaven that will enter into heaven yet to enter in or is there yet that has uh, that does not want to be there. They made a choice. They want to be in the presence of an almighty God. Amen. They made the choice to be there. And then there's those by choice of default, but default, they're in, they're in hell today because they chose not to take the gift. They chose not to take the hand outstretched to pull them out of that sin. They chose not to take advantage of God's grace. Say, Lord, I recognize I'm a sinner. Please save me from your son. They've made a choice to reject that hand of grace. Life and death, he gives us a choice. Life and death. He gives us a choice. Didn't have a choice to have dark. It was dark hair at one point in time. <laughs> All dark, but of course not. I didn't have a choice for that. Didn't have a choice for the color of my eyes. Didn't have a choice of how tall I'd be or how broad or anything like that. But I have a choice where I'll spend eternity. That's what's important. Amen. Yeah. I've come to become comfortable in my own skin. Some of our young people struggle with that. I struggled with it as a young person, but I'm thankful that God gave me the choice to, to receive his son. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let me read this last verse. First Chronicles chapter 29, 11 through 12. This is a prayer made by David. It's a, a, a doxology prayer. You'll see a, a resemblance of the, of the end of the Lord's Prayer. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. That's the God we serve. Amen. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, it'll keep us on track. When we use it as an outline, it'll keep us on track from our prayers not being small and self-centered, but to be... 
to, to be kingdom minded, to think of those that we come in contact with, to give God credit where credit is due. There's people that uh, go throughout their life saying, you know what, I did this, I did this, I did this. You put a lot of effort in it. We're not, we're not denying that, but I tell you, without, without God's power, without God's strength, without the opportunity that, that he gave, nothing is accomplished. Amen. Nothing is accomplished. Amen. If you would, please stand with us. If you're here this morning, you've never asked Jesus Christ in your life, today's the day. We will stand. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. We will, at some point in time, stand before Almighty God. We'll give an account for our life. And you know what? It's not a matter of the good people go to heaven and the bad people go to hell. It's those out who are redeemed. That's who goes to heaven. Those that have Sins have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the ones that go to heaven. And that's what's going to matter come that day. No matter what kind of house we lived in, what we drove, what we, um, a lot of other things that, we're, that we spend time after, that, that won't be an issue. Are you redeemed? What have you done with the life that God has given you? Have you used it for his glory? Today's the day if you've never asked Jesus Christ in your life. We're going to pause for just a minute. If you're here this morning, Come forward. We'd love to pray. We're not here to embarrass anybody. That's not, that's not, all, that's not what we're about. We're here to, to be an encouragement, to be a source of strength and life.